Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Sherman Show. I'm Jeff Sherman here along with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today we have a returning guest to The Sherman Show, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Mayberry, who is a portfolio manager here at Devline. Welcome back, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, in uh, this is the first time that I've had you really on the podcast since uh, we've learned about your moonlighting career or Sam's moonlighting career uh, about the Monday Morning Minutes podcast. And so uh, I thought I would piggyback on uh, what you guys have been doing over there and talking about the outlook for 2023. So uh, thanks for uh, participating here and uh, providing your your views for the world to view. Yeah, I'm definitely. It's uh, you know, it should be an interesting year. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think also. Yeah, well, today is January 19th of 2023. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that for our legal and compliance folks out there. Uh, so all views are as of that day, and you can hold uh, Jeff Mayberry accountable from that point going forward. So uh, th thanks for that accountability, Jeff. And so speaking of accountability, uh, we did this episode uh, almost a year ago. Uh, and we prognosticated about 2022. And so I think uh, probably the best thing to do is go through a postmortem of what uh, 2022's views look like, uh, what actually materialized. And uh, let's see if that uh, lends any credence to our all of our forecasts for 2023. So um, you, you started off last year uh, saying that, you know, the market is, uh, is not expecting a recession. I'll give you a check. Or at least I'll give you a check for saying that the market wasn't, um, <laughs> and uh, it never materialized last year. Uh, you said that um, you know the the volatility was driven by the Fed in January and likely to persist. Man, there's two for two. Um, GDP forecasts don't look great. Looks like it's going to be a slow growth year. Kind of nailed that at least in the first half of the year, right? Um, you know, Omicron, uh, when's the last time we've talked about COVID and the likes, you know, so numbers coming down, maybe COVID's behind us. You, you didn't want to chest stump about that, but I'll give you, uh, I'll give you that again, uh, as a, as another positive, uh, you thought that second quarter GDP would be stronger than the first, uh, they were both negative, but, um, you were correct. So I, I won't, I won't call you a liar over the, the sign. Yeah, it's just a directionality you're calling. Um, and you said inflation would come down in 2022, um, uh, I guess you could argue that if we did this in like August or September, you'd be right. Uh, but I think you kind of failed on that one, as did the entire marketplace. Um, you also said you're hopeful that we don't get a 7% CPI. Um, and uh, that's exactly what we got. Or I think it was 6.9 actually was the official number. So um, I guess I could call that a victory. But uh, one of the folks we had uh, kind of summarize all this said you failed because it was a, a nine handle at one point. But I'll give you credit at six nine. Uh, we didn't get there. Well, I'd say I, I was hopeful, and I think I, yeah. that's always correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're probably still hopeful that we yeah. don't see a seven again, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, as I think about that, you know, um, one thing you talked about too last year was Fed policy. So I want to bring all these things back together because I think they're still important, right? As we think about 2023. You know, all, all eyes are on the Fed, and they have been really for the last five months or so. And so, um, you told us that the Fed was going to be an inflation fighter. Um, the difference between this cycle and the previous ones is that we haven't seen this inflationary regime um, perfect. Uh, you said that the Fed would not keep an eye on the stock market closely. Um, I think that was a check too. Um, you know, um, the the strike the the strike on the Fed put is much lower. I, I think a lot of people agree with that, and we saw that last year. Uh, although we're, we're kind of at levels that um, may, maybe don't feel like there's a, a Fed put out there, uh, or maybe there is a Fed put, I should say. Um, and you say that the Fed could actually raise rates a lot, and it wouldn't impact the labor market because of the strength there. And I'll, I'll give you a lot of credit for that one, because that was not a popular opinion, too. Um, but that came to fruition. So talk to me, uh, talk to us and the viewers out there about what you're thinking about the Fed now in light of the inflation, um, and what does it mean for uh, investors today? Yeah, certainly, you know, inflation's coming down, so that's, that's good uh, from its peak. Um, you know, the Fed is, uh, you know, I guess pro probably right around when this episode is going to be released in a couple of weeks, there's a Fed meeting, so the Fed market's pricing in 100% probability of the Fed raising 25 bips then. Uh, the real question is, where do they go from there? Do they the market's pricing in, uh, you know, 75% chance of another 25 in, uh, in, on March 22nd, 
And, uh, you know, then the market's pricing in some cuts th- further out in the year, but the Fed has been pretty uh, unanimous uh, as far as uh, speeches go about how, the, how they don't think that uh, they're going to cut rates at all in, uh, in 2023. So I'm kind of on the side of the Fed that they are, you know, you know they're not going to cut rates. I don't know how high they're going to go. Um, certainly, I think that uh, they're, they're talking another 50, 75. That seems reasonable uh, from here. But, you know, the labor market's still strong. You know, obviously, it's, it's backwards looking data that we're looking at. Uh, but it's still very strong in the Fed from their December dots are, um, are they're, they're expecting a, you know, a 1% increase in the unemployment rate and no, no Fed cuts. So if we get that, I, I would say that the Fed is, would still be comfortable with rates uh, staying at these higher levels. So I don't really so see. What do, you, a- what do you make of like the market uh, really reacting to this inflation data really over the last three or four prints, right? So we saw that in the CPI data. We've also seen the PPI data. And we know that the producer price index is the PPI, which tends to lead the consumer price index as well. And we're starting to see some deflationary data there also. Um, but the market has rallied a lot. The market has loosened financial conditions by the rate rally, the tightening in credit spreads. Uh, you could argue that's what's led to some of the, um, the, the equity market rally we've seen here in the U.S. Uh, as well. And so what do you make of that, where the Fed keeps saying that they're, they're iterating this idea, and even the dovish folks out there on, on the Fed that were voters keep saying 5%. There's a 5% number, 5% number, and the market says you're not going to get there. Um, what, what's with this disconnect? I mean, I think the way, the way I kind of look at it is the, the, the market is a probability machine, right? So there's a certain probability that they get, the Fed gets exactly what they want. Um, I don't think, you know, the market's pricing in, you know, call it 50 basis points in Fed cuts uh, in the second half of the year. But I think that if we get a recession, if in unemployment kind of skyrockets, if uh, things, if we get like a, a pretty bad recession, not a, not a shallow recession, the market's there, the Fed's not going to just cut 50, they're going to cut. 100, they're going to cut, you know, 200, but maybe there's a 25% probability that they cut 200 when the market prices in that in as a 50 basis point cut. Uh, so I don't think you're going to see them. I guess if you get kind of a softish landing, uh, they, they, they feel like the um, uh, inflation is, has come down to within their, their reasonable range, to kind of around their 2% target, uh, and labor market continues to be strong, maybe they cut 50 um, or, or tw- you know, 25, 25, a couple of times. And, you know, to, to kind of make the, uh, make it their, their policy less restrictive, but it seems like that's all, that's kind of a low probability event in, in my mind. Yeah. And so, you know, um, one thing that the, the Fed is, they're not just uh, focused on price stability, they have the dual mandate, right? And that dual mandate is full employment. And it's kind of funny when you think about full employment, they're forecasting the unemployment rate to go up this year. That doesn't sound like the directionality of moving towards full employment um, to me, but that full employment is just really a way of saying that they, they really want to focus on the labor market and have, you know, be, there be job creation out there as well. Um, so given that side of the equation, is the market too myopic, um, just inflation and not thinking about the labor? Or is it what you're, you know, you'd mentioned that labor lags. And so, uh, should we be dismissive of the strength we saw? I mean, as we record today, uh, we saw one of the, the more recent low prints in initial jobless claims out today. Continuing claims continue to kind of trudge along near this kind of pre-pandemic level, albeit off of the, the massive lows we saw over the course of the summer. And so is the market being too myopic on the inflation? Is the market saying that labor is just going to catch up? How are you thinking about that and, and thinking about what that means for Fed policy? I mean, I think that uh, the market has been so focused on inflation for the past, you know, 13, 14 months, uh, when inflation really became came to the forefront again, that they're having a hard time shifting toward away from that inflation. So they are kind of, kind of myopically focused on inflation. Uh, the labor market, there's been nothing out there to, to worry them. Uh, the, you know, things are still strong. So they're kind of just pushing that back other than, you know, the, the non-farm payroll Fridays when uh, the labor market comes, you know, to, to the forefront of people's minds, but then it disappears, you know, for another, another month. So I think that they're uh, m- much more focused on, on uh, the non, the payroll numbers and then inflation and really the, the jobless claims that we get every week. Uh, I, I think the market doesn't seem to be reacting to those a- at all. 
Yeah. As, as I mentioned on our investment team's call today, um, you know, one thing I find kind of interesting about the labor market is the wage growth data. And we heard this from Chairman Powell uh, back at the last press conference in December, where he said the level of wage growth, he doesn't call it wage inflation, because, um, you know, he's not an employer, he's an employee, <laughs> so it's wage growth, right? Um, but the level of wage growth is not consistent with a 2% inflation target, or a 2% inflation rate, I should say. And so um, that that made me kind of uh, scratch my head and say, okay, what number is, right? Is it 2%? I, I think it's a little bit above that. But, you know, we've seen average hourly earnings kind of dip down uh, from the from the recent highs. It's down to about 4.6, I believe, is the last print on a year-over-year -year basis. But when you look at kind of the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, which, you know, adjusts for the compositional difference, it compares the same people. Uh, so it's the same uh, job set. What you find is that that one sells a six handle on it. So if if we start to actually bring labor into the picture, um, do you think that maybe the market would be pricing things differently if, if you thought about that labor market? And, you know, again, this is a Fed measure, right? It's the Atlanta Fed putting this, this number out. Should we be more concerned about that? And does that mean potentially there's more upside to Fed policy or there's risk at least to the upside on Fed policy because of that data? Yeah, I think that, that that's a good point. You know, that's something that, they don't want to get caught in that wage price spiral that, that uh, people talk about. And so they are going to focus on that and focus on them. And that's why, like, it seems like uh, Chair Powell brings up different labor market components. Every, you know, Sam and I always joke of that. Uh, he just brings up whatever fits his narrative that he wants to talk about, you know, talks about jolts or the employment cost index or the uh, University of Michigan uh, inflation, long-term inflation expectations. Uh, he brings it up when it fits the narrative for that meeting. And then, you know, just goes, everyone else starts to focus on it. So then it goes by the wayside and he doesn't talk about it again. Uh, but that, I really think that the, that wage growth, uh, that Atlanta Fed wage growth uh, tracker number is one that, because it is, as you said, it, it kind of keeps the cohort the same, that uh, it is something to keep an eye on. And if that number continues to be high, I think you're right. The Fed will um, certainly be worried that that's going to continue to keep inflation above its target. And that they're gonna that would that would bias them more towards keeping rates at a higher level. All right, one more and I'll one let Sam jump in. Uh, one more on this too, because I just want to stay continuous. Is that as I think about this too, and we think about where you know the market is pricing things. Uh, uh, do, do you think that if the Fed was indeed if we got this kind of higher level of wages, and or at least this persistent level, and let's say we don't see this degradation within. The labor market. I know there's some big announcements. You know, it tends to be. I think I feel like the job losses are focused in tech and financial services at this point. So best of luck to all of us staying employed. Uh, but that being said, you know, if if we think about that, if it, that does keep the Fed and push a little bit higher, does the bond market play along? And we all know that our boss, you know, Mr. Gunlock, says that you know the Fed follows the bond market and follows the two year. Does the market start to follow back a little bit? Or do you think that it just says that if the Fed continues to push and the interpretation of this is that it is just going to force and tip the hand into the recession? So how do you think about that if that risk to higher Fed uh, policy or higher rates in Fed policy does materialize? I mean, I think that the, the two-year will follow, you know, the two-year kind of followed the, or the Fed followed the two-year because of the four guidance that the Fed was giving so much last year. And that if uh, the, the Fed is is still worried about this, you know, wage wage inflation or or, or wage growth, um, I'll, I'll, I'll I am also an employee, so I'll, I'll call it wage growth. Um, that if they're still worried about, it, then they're going to be talking about it a lot, and they're going to kind of shift the market's focus towards that. And that uh, that you can see the kind of the two year yields rise as the Fed talks into the we're going to be stronger, we're going to try to keep this wage growth under under control, not let it get out of control. And that, that means we're going to stay at this restrictive uh, levels on, on Fed funds for a longer period of time. Yeah, and, and I guess that would necessitate the two-year going higher, right? If, if indeed the market believes them, right? So it's a belief. And I, I think you, you said it best with that. It's a probabilistic weighting machine at the beginning. So Sam, I know you were eager to talk. I apologize for cutting you off. No apologies needed. I guess I just wanted to continue on this theme here too, with just trying to, you know, Parse some of the language that always has given in the past regarding the thinking of 
where they're going to take the path of rates. And a lot of it has been focused on the idea of a real yield or when we take a look at across the curve, when you take a look at uh, where they're thinking about putting the, the target on the ultimate Fed funds target rate, is it going to be in excess of where we saw in his, um, I think his chosen me me measure was the, the core PCE, which has been coming down, at least for the next few prints. We do have another PCE print coming out next week. Uh, so I, I think that's the last full week of January, but the last one was around I don't know, somewhere around four and a half, four, seven, somewhere around there. Let's just call it four, six, uh, which is kind of in range of where we are right now at the Fed funds target rate um, and where, you know, ultimately what the market is going to think it's going to go. So if that's the case and core PCE continues to trend down from that perspective, perhaps we are at that point where, um, you know, the Fed starts to pull back on what they're thinking about in terms of the ultimate rate, but then also where they think, how long they think they have to pa pause that for. And I think that also applies for, the notion that you brought up there, Sherman, with, you know, what is an appropriate amount of wage inflation or wage growth? I, too, yeah, am just, an employee. Just, uh, <laughs> to, to bring it out there, because I was looking at this before we jumped on, is the estimate for the deflator for next uh, for the year over year for the next print is actually 4.4%. So that would put us roughly, if you get the hike, we would be above that if indeed all of those things materialize. Yeah. Now the rest of the curve, uh, treasury, the actual treasury curve hasn't really been cooperating because I think he did mention as well that he wants to see the entire curve in, in terms of the real real yields and some of the rally that we've seen thus far in the first uh, 19 calendar days of, of the month has uh, been against that move. So we'll see what, what happens with regards to rates, but I guess that would be the, the next question I would pose for, for Mayberry. I mean, do you think we are going to see um, I don't know, is the two years still holding on to the the four percent? Yeah, four four twelve right now. Um, but everything after that has a three handle. Do you think we start to see, or you know, we see another four handle across the the rest of the treasury curve this year, Jeff? Or do you think uh, we're pretty much going to be living in a, a three handle type of land for for two thousand twenty three? I mean, the ten years at three forty right now. So that's a long way to go to get up to that four handle again. But I think that. I think that you, we, we could see us get up to that maybe like 375, that kind of range we were in before we broke to that to 420-ish level um, early, earlier, or I guess late, later last year. Um, but I think, you know, I, I don't think we've seen the, uh, I don't think we're at the, uh, at the high in rates, I guess I, I would say. I think rates are going to go up from here, or could go up from here, or we'll say, we'll say they're going to go up from here. We're not at the, uh, at the highs of the year. Um, but I don't think we get back up to that. I don't think we get to a four handle. Yeah, it seems that also that so many prognosticators like I want to buy rates when the tenure hits four, right? So it's one of those kind of self-fulfilling prophecies that it, it never gets there because everybody's targeting that number. So you have to step in beforehand. And the trading range prior to this, you know, I, I know you said it's 340, but the trading range was 340 roughly to like 390, right? kind of like 345-ish, but, um, and, you know, something that I'd focused on for the last few years was that we tend to really look in the last, let's call it six or seven years, we trade in these like 50 basis point ranges when it comes to tenure, and it just moves, right? So, I mean, it sounds obvious, but you have this 50 basis point range, we bounce around, and when we break through it, we tend to set that the, the cap becomes the floor, and the floor becomes the cap, depending on the direction and things are moving. And so, you know, given that, um, so it sounds like to me under that premise, you know, it, you think that we kind of stay in this range and then, you know, the next breakdown would be to the downside. Or do you think that we kind of stay in this range for the remainder of 2022 or 2023? Sorry. No, I, I think we, I think we'll break out into a, into a new range. I think we're, I think we're the lower end of the range right now. So that will break up to a, a upside, higher, higher range, higher yield range. Yeah. You do. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and so um, what, you know, as you think about too, as a fixed income investor, you know, very painful year. I don't think we have to, anybody needs to commiserate about that. I think we all, we all saw that um, it, it was a, a record in droves. And so as you think about it right now, you know, how are you thinking about, you know, your job as an allocator, right? So the fixed income marketplace, where do you find things to be attractive what are things that you think have you know elevated levels of risk today, or at least you know from relative to the 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 amount you're being paid to take those risks? And so you know uh, 
I, I posed this question at the round table. Um, you got to set it and forget it uh, allocation. This is the way to keep you an honest man. Um, you know, you got to set it today and you can't touch it for the rest of the year. How do you allocate across the fixed income marketplace today? Or how do you think about it? It doesn't have to be precise, but you can over underway, you know, g give me your, give me how you're thinking about the market, given the risk you've laid out here. Yeah. I mean, I think that certainly the market is, uh, I guess it's hard to say because the market, I said the market's not really pricing in a, a higher probability of recession, but you see, all, you know, economists talking about recession, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, I think it's the New York Fed has some probability of recession indicators and we're at high numbers. You see yeah, a lot but that's of just, uh, that's just the yield curve, right? That, that's the yield curve signal. I think that's where that Fed yeah. probability model comes from. But, you know, have you, do you recall in either of your careers, I know we've all kind of spanned the same area, where economists were actually forecasting recessions? It doesn't see, it certainly uh, feels like if this is, if we do get a recession next year, it's the most widely uh, kind of forecasted recession, at least that I can remember. Yeah. Um, so, you know, then that makes me feel like, oh, maybe we don't get a recession just because everyone, if everyone's planning for it, then, uh, you know, it, it doesn't become a, it, uh, you know, if people are worried about it, then maybe they cut back on their spending now and then you don't get the recession because it's not, uh, uh, you don't have that, that kind of surprise. Um, but I think, you know, not knowing where the, if we are going to get a recession, I think that it makes sense to, you know, kind of, you know, we always like to talk about barbell portfolios, but put together your barbell portfolio, put together your long-term treasury rates. Um, maybe don't, maybe don't buy your, your below investment grade, your junk, junk bonds, but buy something more, uh, you know, kind of low, low investment grade type, um, whether it's corporate bonds or securitized credit, buy those and put those two, put those pieces together. We can get a you know a better yielding portfolio, but really be protected from the the downside in case a recession does come. You get that uh, flight to quality bid for your longer duration treasuries, and you know maybe even I'd, I'd like to allocate a you know, a sizable portion, you know ten percent, call it to to kind of cash or or you know, T bills. The the six month T bill is the highest point on the curve, like four eighty or so. So that, that means sounds pretty attractive. Maybe you know put that in uh, and roll that in six months. Or 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 uh, you know six months and then a five month or to get us to the end of the year since it is uh, we're kind of a, a month in already or so a month in yeah yeah um, well I didn't I, I didn't say you can't roll a position so, uh, <laughs> so that's kind of fair I mean no I, I think it makes sense too to own a little bit of the cash asset too and you know I've had a lot of clients ask me like why don't I just park all my money in like the three month or the six month and I I say you know th there's nothing wrong with having a slug there because as you said. We're kind of at this lower end of the range. Maybe rates push up. I think you want to be tactical and nimble, which I didn't give you the ability to do in that question. <laughs> uh, but uh, the problem you have there is that if these recession risks materialize, you don't have the duration, right? You don't get that offset. And so it doesn't allow you to take those credit positions. So, um, you know, uh, I've been I've been an advocate of the same thing. I, th I think we, we, we work from the same playbook a lot of times, but, you know, it's a... If you want to allocate that cash, that's fine. Say it's 25%, you want to allocate to the cash. But the other 75 should be in that same kind of structured trade because there is such a yield opportunity out there. It may not feel like it when you see the 10-year at 340 and you see the six-month bill sitting there at 480, right? It may not feel like there's yield out there, but there is total return potential. And that's what we're really focused on here. Yeah, and, and after, and after of, last year's, you have a lot of uh, potential for price appreciation from these lower price levels, or at least, uh, you know, to go back to par, uh, you have some price appreciation. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Sam, to cut you off again. It's all right. It's all right. I'm used to it. But uh, one of the things he, <laughs> he didn't apologize, he didn't apologize to say no, no apologies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nothing to hang on that one. But uh, one of the things among the others, amongst the others that you got right was the call for not only short duration, but floating rate as well. And I noticed he didn't mention that in uh, your, your allocation mix there. Um, of it, with with that policy and the way that rates moved last year, particularly on the short end, and uh, what we saw through 2022 was floating rate was actually one of the, depending on how you cut the baloney, there was one of the 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 sectors within there, uh, the fixed income universe that did have positive returns. If you're talking about up in credit for let's say bank loans or even um, CLOs, collateralized loan obligations 
how maybe, are you thinking? Have you always found it interesting that, that Sam likes to cut his bologna? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Instead of slice it? Did I said cut or slice. <laughs> I don't know. You, when I when, when I was forced to eat bologna as a child, it usually came pre-sliced. But pre maybe we were fancy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I did get Oscar Mayer stuff as well. My one of my favorite sandwiches is Oscar Mayer bologna. You know, uh, yellow French mustard. I think they call French's yellow mustard, and then uh, Wonder Bread with the crust yeah. on. That was my favorite lunch. Just one slice yeah. of bologna. Oh, no, but I would add to it. We got a slice of the American cheese. You know, the fancy. Yeah. It's so fancy. It's got to be prepackaged. I stole that from Judah Freelander. But um, the thing is, is uh, you got to put that American cheese on it with the bologna and just go full like cardiac arrest. I was going to say that sounds like a Sam grew up in the Midwest. Yeah, most definitely. But that cheese was a luxury item at times. So I just ended up uh, with this one slice of bologna to make it stretch that uh, pack of Wonder Bread. But uh, bringing it back with this floating rate, uh, so you ignore, you, you didn't mention it for your allegation. Are you talking about eliminating it or not having it in the portfolio at all? Are there parts of the floating rate market that you prefer over others, if any? Well, I think that the, the problem that I see with kind of the bank loan space or, uh, is that, you know, it's below investment grade. You have that recession risk. Um, so you, you have that. Um, the potential for a lot of spread widening there if we do get into recession. And it's not like uh, the, the, the fixed rate high yield market where the, the companies have locked in these, these lower rates or these low, low fixed rates over the past few years. It's you know, because it is floating, it's resetting. And you know, what's good for, for the investor in, in getting higher coupon, the, the, you know, the lender has to pay that higher coupon. So uh, I, I kind of feel like that's... Um, you know, that the sp potential spread widening is something that uh, I'd like to just kind of stay away from uh, if possible, and maybe maybe by sec sec sectors that have a little bit less uh, potential spread widening. Yeah, I would I would piggyback on that comment and just say that, you know, the other thing is, too, is that as an investor, if the, the Fed has to cut and let's say they cut 100 or 200, you know, it's extreme because we're mired in a in a relatively deep recession. Your return potential goes down because your coupons go down. So all the benefits you have of this coupon reset, although again a negative for the lender. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, to, to the yeah to the no the lend e not the lender. Sorry, uh, I get the ers and the es confused. I have to think through them. Uh, but you know what you find is that you know the the antithesis of that exists in the corporate bond market, right? Like. You have a lot of fixed rate coupon. Um, it was refinanced back over the last couple of years, not a, not a heavy refinance calendar last year. And therefore, those terms and those maturities are extended out and they have very low coupons. So um, for, for those wanting anecdotes, think about anybody who originated a mortgage two years ago, right? Extremely low rates. It's locked in. You have 30-year financing. And so um, this is part of the argument that that people make about corporate credit that, you know, uh, a lot of it is in decent shape on that financing. And though even though we've seen significantly higher rates right now, they haven't really materialized. And this is one of the things about the Fed policy, because it was so rapid, you know, um, there's this paper that came out from one of the entities of the Fed saying that Fed policy should operate with a slower lag, uh, I'm sorry, a, fat, uh, a slower lag, meaning that Fed policy should translate in the economy quicker than it has in, in many other cycles. I would kind of argue that maybe it should be the other way around, bro, right? Because, you know, we've seen this rapid rise. You know, you've had the 425 basis points over the course of like nine months, right? Um, it hasn't really hit the corporate market. The corporate market is the traditional, you know, mechanism to transmit Fed policy to, to the economy. And it's not necessarily the consumer. So, what do you think about that kind of, I'll, I'll call it thesis, um, you know, uh, an idea about maybe the Fed policy slower. So we really haven't seen much of those hikes in the economy. Okay, and you can say there's the housing market. Of course, that's gotten hit. That's very interest rate sensitive. Um, but what, what's your thought about that idea? I mean, I think that's right. I think that, you know, just given the fact that the, the we're so, so large refi waves in, in the corporate bond space over the past, you know, at the low rates, uh, corporate treasurers did what they should do and and lock in those low rates that I think that uh, there is going to it should be a longer lag I would agree with that you know outside of I guess it, outside of as as the mortgage market or the housing market as you said um, so I guess it depends on how much of that um, housing market um, you know price price decreases and, and lower activity 
kind of translates to the overall economy. Um, and, you know, people were certainly the housing market is a smaller piece of the overall economy than it was in, you know, 06, 07. Uh, and that's what people are worried about, um, that kind of, uh, that, those not kind of knock on effects. But I think that uh, because of that, that it's, uh, you know, you do, I think, I think you're right. And I haven't really thought about it before, but I think you're right. It's going to be a longer lag period just because of the, the, the recent uh, low interest rates that we did experience. So, so maybe the Fed should indeed just pause, right? You know, like maybe uh, the tightening regime is just pausing and letting all this stuff, this happen as well. Um, but one more thing that doesn't get a lot of airplay these days, and, um, you know, it, it's something that's going on behind the scenes is quantitative tightening. What's your outlook for quantitative tightening in 2023? Um, by the way, they're still doing it. Uh, I like how people talk about they're doing 95 billion a month. It's like, no, it's up to. And by the way, hardly anything in the mortgage market is getting done because of the, the structure of those mortgages. Just there's not a lot of uh, refinancing activity. So what, what's your outlook for QT for 2023? And how do you think about that coupled with this idea of uh, the market price in Fed cuts? I think that, you know, Sam and I talk about it all the time about how after every Fed press conference, there's been no questions about, about the balance sheet. At least since uh, September, right? Yeah, since they got to since they got to their 95, you know, the, the 95 cap was implemented. There's been no questions. And certainly some of that's probably due to uh, the they they you know they know what kind of questions the people are gonna the reporters are gonna ask. So if you have balance sheet on top of mind, they're not gonna call on you to ask a question. Or or at least that's the conspiracy theory uh, side of things. Uh, but this is really what the Fed wanted. They they wanted it to run in the background. They wanted it to be on autopilot and really have, have people really not concerned about it. But I think that uh, if we get to a place where, um, you know, maybe maybe the Fed is pausing and they want to kind of tweak around the edges a little bit, they can always, uh, you know, reduce the cap or, or say, you know, we're going to we're going to only buy, you know, or only reinvest 50 billion in, uh, treasuries or the 50 billion roll off this month instead of 60. Um, and, and so they can kind of play around the edges there and people really won't be concerned or won't, won't be worried about, about it. So I think that's another way for them to, um, you know, kind of uh, affect things without really uh, doing it from their, their headline Fed funds rate. So, you know, maybe they, maybe they, or maybe they, you know, if they get to a place where they're pausing and they're like, you know, we don't want to go another 25, that's kind of uh, putting, making the market too restrictive. Maybe they say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to open up the 95 or make the cap of 95 treasuries and mortgages, you know, because mortgages, as you said, we're getting no, no refis. And they say, you know what, same, same cap, just going to change the mix. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's another way to do it. I think that would marginally be negative for rates, meaning that would push rates higher yeah. or negative for treasuries at, at the that side. But do you think it, it, that they need to stop QE? I'm sorry, stop QT. I'm just so used to saying QE over, <laughs> over the last 13 years. Um, do you think that they have to stop QT before they cut rates? I mean, or they can do it contemporaneously, or do you think that they still want to have QT go on in the background because the goal is to get, you know, the, the balance sheet to a, a targeted percentage of GDP? I mean, if they, if they stop QT when, when they're about to cut rate or when they're cutting rates, then I think that they're, they're, the balance sheet will never get to the, the level they wanted to get to, right? So if they, you know, we, before this whole quantitative easing, um, cycle started or, or this idea started, there was always, people were always like, the Fed wants to raise rates so that they can cut rates if there's a problem. And here, they maybe they want to, uh, they, they've been raising rates, so their first step should cut them. They know what the effect is of, or they think they, at least they have a, a good understanding of how rate cuts affect the economy um, and that uh, they still don't know how much, you know, so I think, you know, they're not as well versed in this QT versus QE and its effect on the economy. Uh, so maybe they want to keep the QT going while they cut rates. And it's only the only when they get to the closer to the zero lower bound where they say, OK, well, I mean, I guess we always say used to say zero lower bound. It's not really the lower bound anymore, but they can say, OK, well, now that we're 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 much lower rate levels, Fed funds, funds, Fed funds levels. Now we're going to stop the QT. Um, and, and so that's kind of the secondary step. So I think they because they want to get the balance sheet down that. They're, they're much more biased towards just keeping it running in the background. Yeah. No Let me jump what. on one more of that too, which you said there too, is that they they feel like they understand, you know, the transmission mechanism from uh, interest rate policy. Um, but the question is, is like cutting rates at this point, let's say they cut a hundred. 
What does it do? What it helps the floating rate market. Uh, what else does it do? I, I mean, get... you you don't uninvert you kind of in, uninvert the curve. Maybe depends on what point. Really not at a three forty ten year, right? So, like, what what does does it really affect things in the economy? I would say not, I would not really, right? You you've already seen a hundred basis point decrease or so in in the ten year, and you know. Certainly financial conditions are, are looser, but it doesn't really feel like on the economy, things aren't really being affected. So um, I think if they cut 100, the, the way it affects the economy is that uh, it sends the message that, okay, the Fed is worried about the economy. Um, you know, does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy of, okay, I'm, I'm tightening my belt because the Fed's worried about the economy, which causes the recession or causes the recession to go deeper uh, until you get to a level where it's like, okay, well, now we're at this a uh, very low, um, you know, very low rate levels where now I can feel like I'm, I'm going to lever up because rates are so low and kind of the cost of borrowing so low. Um, I think because we've been at so such low rate levels for such a long time, it takes a long time to get to those again to those rate levels where people feel like it's okay to lever up because they're so used to the, you know, almost, you know, very low zero ish type of uh, cost of leverage. Not, I mean, when we take a look at it, it's not usually the magnitude of the cut that that really matters. We've seen, you know, the Fed when they want to, they can cut in 100 basis point plus chunks, right? But really, it's it's the catalyst for the reason for them to cut. And typically, when we've taken a look at, it, we've been talking about the yield curve, how it's inverted, and it's a signal of a recession. But really, the better leading the better indicator of the timing of a recession at least what we've seen in the past with the yield curve inversion is when the curve starts to steepen again and the curve starts to steepen because the fed starts cutting rates because the economy underlying is is weakening so it is a behavior or psychological indicator when the fed starts to hike you know perhaps you know people are, are fearful of the fact that the economy is actually the fed knows something that the the um, the market doesn't yeah, but I think at that point, the catalyst for the Fed cutting is going to be something that deteriorates materially in the economy. And right now, when we think about it, what has been the foundation for the positive economic growth that we've seen of late is really just that, that foundation of strong employment. So I think a lot of it comes down to whether or not these employment numbers hold, um, whichever way you cut it. If you want to look at the non-farm payrolls, um, you know, I know we have to dig beneath the hood when we start looking at the headline unemployment rate to take a look at the labor force, the number of people employed, the people exiting and such. But overall, I think that is the last kind of indicator standing in terms of having the positive uh, um, impact on the economy. If that goes, that's where you really start to see the catalyst for the Fed to start pull back on some of these tighter monetary um, tools yeah, but also that the the one holdout we had prior to that, and I guess yeah, it's could have would have should have because it's already happened, right? But was the ISM services, right? And we know that that right. that number kind of collapsed and it's in contractionary ter territory now. And so the reason that one's a bit of a scary one is that historically, when both manufacturing and services contract, uh, it is a harbinger of a recession on the horizon. Doesn't say it's imminent. Uh, but, you know, it usually is six to 12 months out. And so um, maybe that's another consistency there. Or, you know, as I always say, one data point doesn't make a trend, um, but you connect it to a few other ones. There definitely is a downward trend inside of it. So um, so maybe we spent a lot of time on Fed, inflation, bonds. Uh, obviously, that's our, you know, kind of our bread and butter around here. But uh, talk to me about the equity market, too. Uh, what, what do you, you see? We got S&P around 4,000. Let's call it. Let's round it. It's in the high 3900s or so, 3950. Um, you got that. Um, we've seen, you know, the Dow significantly outperform being a higher quality index last year. Uh, tech being, you know, the more volatile, uh, obviously predicated on a lot of low rates and some of those business models. Um, what are you seeing for 2023? How are you thinking about the allocation there? And uh, I want to, I want to hold your feet to the fire here. You got the global equity market to play with. What's your set and forget it for 11 months? I mean, I think that just given kind of the the, the recession worries that we've laid out, um, I would say that uh, you you would try to underweight, um, underweight the U.S. stock market. I think that, you know, tech being such a, a bad, or the tech area being such a, a bad performer last year, you've seen the layoffs now. So 
maybe that gets a maybe it'd be a little overweight tech just because uh, they're starting to get their house in order. Uh, you know, taking you know as, as you said the layoffs there, um, and, and I really like the um, you know the kind of the de developed world. You know, people were talking about so much. There's so much worry going on in Europe uh, about the European economies. You know, whether it was they were going to survive the winter. Um, and survive the the cost of, of you know gas heating uh, across Europe. And this seems to have, even though you know, even though we're we have we're just kind of in the middle of winter or, or just getting started on winter. I think that um, you know just because it's been it's been kind of relatively warm over there, that uh, you've seen this the stock market kind of rebound there. So I think I like kind of the developed uh, equities. I'd overweight that, um, and then you know. For, for years, we've always been talking about how we like EM equities, and I think that it's really a case of, you know, over the long term or, or kind of the medium term, I guess, um, liking those. So maybe uh, I, I'd still could be kind of, uh, you know, market weight, I guess, EM, EM equities. So kind of a neutral, neutral on those. But uh, that's kind of how I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it right now. And um, you, know, uh, you know, I guess next year we'll see. Uh, how, how wrong yeah, well, was. you got it pretty good last year. You, you said go <laughs> EM. You said the next best would be uh, Europe, and then the worst would be the U.S. And so uh, EM was slightly worse than the U.S., so you kind of missed on that. But Europe was the top performer, only losing nine percent in dollar terms. So um, you know, so got that pretty well as as well. So maybe people should be listening to some of your asset allocation advice. So let's pull it together. Let's go stocks, bonds. Now, how do you think about that, given how you, you distill down the bond market, you distill down the equity market? How do you think about the allocation between stocks and bonds? Again, set it, forget it. We'll, we'll revisit in 24. I think that given uh, kind of valuations, I would, instead of uh, 60, 40, 60 stocks, 40, 40 bonds, I'd, I'd other way around bro it and go 60, 60 bonds, get that yield, earn that carry over, over the next 11 months and stick your 40% in, in stocks. and. Uh, you know, for the, for the set it and forget it type. Okay. Now let's talk about how you see the world, the world materializing. How would these things change if you have the ability to be flexible and how your forecasts are kind of thinking about it? If you had a playbook for, I don't know, call it first half of your second half, you're thinking about playing something a quarter and then something else. So now give me the year. If you, you know, kind of how you're, how you're thinking about the economic data, the fed inflation, all this coming together and give me kind of a path of how you think it plays out and how the, how we should allocate be given that path. I think that you just given the fact that the, the recession talk is so high right now, um, I, I, I go towards more safety right now. And then, you know, say, say, you know, end of June, uh, when you, we can reevaluate, uh, kind of see how, see how the labor market shakes out. And if labor market is continuing to be strong, then you're okay. And you, then you're kind of, you're okay adding on risk, um, adding on risk for the second half of the year. And, uh, you know, but if uh, things are getting weaker, then obviously you would want to decrease some of your risk uh, there. So that's kind of how I would I would play it and really just focus on the labor market, assuming uh, still assuming that, uh, you know, the inflation is continuing its downward trend. Um, that, that's really kind of what what if we had to do it, choose a, a one variable, uh, you know, toggle that that's what <laughs> I would choose. Yeah. The infamous uh, toggle. <laughs> uh, Lau, Lau, any uh, differences of opinion here? I think it's the Mayberry's got the right way of thinking about it. I mean, I do know that um, with regards to recession, it, for me, I, I do think that the likelihood of it being a soft landing versus a hard landing is higher. And I do think that does come towards the end of next year. So I agree with that kind of the, the mindset that Barry laid, or Mayberry laid out in terms of the first half versus the second half. The second half is kind of where you might start. But it's a soft in. land if Mayberry loses his job. It's a hard land if you lose <laughs> your job, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, hopefully neither of us lose our yeah. job. We'll take it somewhere in the middle then. But uh, yeah. uh, with that, I mean, I do think the idea of being saving some of that dry powder for you know during the first half and perhaps looking and thinking about it, being patient you know, and start looking for opportunities to deploy it sometime in the second half. I mean, I would even say maybe in the fourth quarter you know, of 2023, but I do like the idea of treasuries a little bit less so today, you know, given that that strong mood that we've had at you know, since the beginning of the year, but I still like treasuries because of the duration. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're, if you want protection, I still think there's no better safe haven asset than, than U.S. treasuries. And in this case, you know, despite the, the Fed perhaps being, and, near the end of their cycle, I, I still think that duration aspect of it in the longer end of the curve holds um, 
And you're not really yeah. going to get that pickup at the short end of the curve, despite the short end maybe moving more as, as this, if the curve uh, steepens towards the year end. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, I, I, I like a lot of the ideas here. I like owning riskier credit down as well and using that treasury as the offset, um, like the long bond. I don't care as much of the long bond inside of like the, the portfolio that Mayberry laid out. I kind of like to tenure more with that one, just because I don't think it needs as much of that offset there. And, and some of that credit would be sensitive there. And I also like the idea of owning cash and the dry powder that you bring up. And uh, when I look at, you know, kind of some of the stuff I, you know, haven't really put money to work so far this year, you know, with year and money coming in, I parked it in cash. And so I'm in the same kind of camp as Mayberry's laid out for people like want to own some of that six month bill. And um, I completely agree with that. And so I, I have a probably a, I'd say an above average allocation in cash right now, just because, again, this this rally we've seen right here. I don't want to hold my nose and buy into it. I kind of like earning that cash rate at this point. And I'm pretty kind of full on my credit exposures that I want to own at this point. So um, lastly, real quick, before we wrap the show, um, what about commodities? You know, we all kind of were pro commodities last year. They worked even in the strength of the dollar. Um, you know, they did traffic some of the lows again towards the end of the year, you know, like in oil and some of those. We've seen a pretty nice rebound as the year started. Uh, outlook for commodities? Um, yay, nay, up them, down them. What do you think? Yeah. Sam, as Sam gives the thumbs up. I, yeah. I agree. I, I think thumbs uh, up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I like it as the what if hedge, right? Like if we get more persistent inflation because of the China reopening, that's been my thesis, if that's the case. So I haven't turned my commodity position yet. I've been letting it run. I think it's the right call still. Um, that's why I still have it. But, um, you know, but ultimately, I think that's the what if scenario, too, right? If the reopening really plays out, there's this, you know, re resurgence in the industrial side because of it. Um, I think that commodities are, are still really cheap uh, relative where they should be because of that underinvestment. I was going to say, you know, industrial metals and energy are the two the two sectors I would kind yeah. of overweight there. Yeah, and that's where you really seen that supply deficiency or the production deficiency that Sherman was talking about there. And you know, with agriculture, it's always a wild card, right? I mean, the biggest, biggest is the the seasonal plantings, which you have uh, some insight in, but weather, it's hard to gauge, right? It's something that Mayberry said earlier. It's like everyone was expecting a harsh winter in Europe, and you know, thus far, yeah, the ski chalets and the ski chalets <laughs> in Switzerland are not open, and the ones in California are just bombed on with fresh powder right now, yeah. right? So. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it is very difficult to to do that. So I, I agree with you too. I, I like those two sectors. So it almost sounds like we're a team here and, and working in the same area. So and we talk we talk uh, daily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that's always the goal. So um, you know, sometimes we take the weekends off, but not always. You know, uh, sometimes there's a lot of conversation still. So with that, Mayberry, thanks for coming back on the show. I really appreciate the time. Uh, but you know the rules before you leave. We got to do Sam's favorite part of the show. So, Sam? Yeah. So, usually my favorite part of the show is called Sherman Says, but every time Mr. Mayberry joins us here, I become a participant on the painful side. So, today it's just one closing segment of the show. It's called Sherman Says. And <laughs> we all know the rules, but for our new listeners out there, uh, what we do here is today we have a guest host uh, for the Sherman Says portion. It's none other than Mr. Mark. Kimbrough, an analyst on our team, and he'll be providing a series of prompts alternating within this circle of Sherman, Mayberry, and Lau, offering a unique prompt each to which we will give a top of mind response. Uh, so with that, Mr. Kimbrough, do you want to step in? Yeah, thank you very much for the intro there. Um, I have these ordered up where it's going to be going Sherman, Lau, and then Mayberry. So let's uh, kick this off. Uh, first one up for Mr. Sherman is retail sales. Deteriorating. Uh, for Lau, we have asset allocation. Tactical in 2023. For Mr. Mayberry, we have Europe's warm winter. Which I'll just touch I think we talked about, we just talked about yeah. that, but uh, it's, uh, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'm kind of thankful that we got it and not, uh, not, not having people freeze. Yeah. Agreed, really? that's positive. Uh, next up, let's go atmospheric rivers. I hope they're over. <laughs> Man, I mean, that was that was crazy. Uh, that's the, probably the hardest rain I've seen in, in Southern California 
in the last 20 years. So that was definitely, uh, that was uh, an aberration in storms. So hopefully uh, climate change is not a harbinger of more of those things. We don't need them, you know. Uh, by the way, my flights were canceled. The airport got flooded. So the, if you want to know how bad it was, there was flooding at the airport to close it for two days. So I'm glad we all made it through that safe. Yeah. Uh, next up for uh, Mr. Lau, we have goods deflation. Yes. For Mayberry, we have debt ceiling. Uh, a joke. Yes. A joke. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> Ring the bell each time it hits it, right? <laughs> Light clock. Yeah. Let's circle back around. We have a broadly anticipated recession. Fade it. Uh, let's go rebalancing portfolios. More frequent in 2023. Uh, this one's a bit of a mouthful, Mr. Mayberry. We have uh, artificial intelligence and a conscience. Um, I mean, it seems like it's a pretty fun artificial, the, the AI, the, the chats and stuff. And except for I saw one that uh, they did some, uh, the AI create, put together like a paragraph on like compound interest and this math was all wrong. You would think it would be able to do the math first and then uh, be able to talk about it, but uh, it, it was an article on compound interest and it didn't know how to calculate compound interest. It sounds to me that uh, maybe the programmer did not understand that. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's, those uses don't, you don't necessarily go together, but uh, you know, I think it's pretty, pretty funny there. You know, there was a good Dilbert cartoon this morning that one of the, uh, one of the sell side analysts sent around this morning that was talking about the chat GP and it was uh, asking to kill its boss. And it's like, no, it's too ethical to do that. And it's like, well, can you write me a story on a hypothetical person who is successfully <laughs> able to kill their boss or something like that? And it's like, nope, we'll do. You know? so, anyway. That was, the, that was the point of bringing it up. Everyone refers to the consciousness of AI, but what about a conscience actually having a little, you know, cricket on your shoulder? Uh, next one up. I would argue going... that's uh, sometimes absent in people too. So, yeah, see. Or questionable at least. Uh, next one up is factor investing for Mr. Sherman. I know where you're leading me, you know, Gambro. You want me to talk about <laughs> Cliff and Rob, and I'm gonna I'm gonna abstain from doing that, and uh, I'm gonna side with Cliff and say that you know it's still value is the cheap factor, not the rest of them. The multi-factor looks cheap because of value, but they all have merits. Uh, they're very difficult to time, and so just understand what you own. Appreciate you sussing out the uh, the leading question there, prompt. Yeah, and I know you didn't come up with that <laughs> conscious question. I know who did on the team, so I'll be talking to him later. Well, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Uh, next one is housing supply. Um, I would say. Wait, the Lao's up. Oh no! Wait one second. We're going. Uh, to, uh, this is Lao. Okay, Lao. Lao. That's right. Is that Don't give yeah. Lao. He loves this. Oh yeah. <laughs> Tighter. Uh, next up, Mayberry, we have return of the 60-40 portfolio or the 40-60. 40-60. I think it's important to stay diversified. Don't, uh, don't just go all in on one, on one you know, large sector. Uh, next, we have fragmenting global economy. For Mr. Sherman. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it, but I think the answer is yes. I think we are starting to see that. And I think that COVID was the game changer. And I think it's going to continue for a while. And I think, you know, seeing that China's, you know, actually contracted in population. And again, I, you know, some of that's death related, that that's, that's not the positive side, but birth rates have come down massively. And so cheap labor is kind of done there, at least cheaper labor. And so I think we're going to continue to be somewhat fragmented and I, we're going to redefine supply chain. So uh, that was for Lao, who always makes fun of me for not having one word answers. And so uh, there's one of my loquacious uh, responses, Sam. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next up for uh, Sam, we have Goldilocks. Watch out for those bears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anybody wants to find Goldilocks, yeah. don't watch our rounds table. It was a lot of bears <laughs> out there. So I think uh, Charles, Charles Payne and I were the closest to uh, optimists out there. And uh, there's a, there wasn't a lot to be optimistic about, but uh, 
shout out to the round table and thanks to our guests for doing that. Uh, let's go with rebalancing the economy for Mr. Mayberry. Hmm. Uh, I would say it's a, it just occurs naturally, I guess. Um, you know, I think that it'll, all, it'll, it'll find its balance. Sir. Uh, next up, Water 3%. Finds its levels, oh. right? Water yeah. finds its levels. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Kimbra. No, no, no. It's the natural equilibrium. Uh, so we got for Sherman, we have 3% fed inflation target. Don't, don't discount it not happening or it could, it could happen if we get inflation to be more persistent is what I'm trying to say. Don't sleep. It's not, it's not imminent. They're not going to change their policy until inflation has been fought. It's got to come down. It's got to stay. It's got to moderate. If it moderates at three, I can see that becoming the policy. That's what I'm trying to get at. Don't then, expect them to announce it this year. Then they start thinking about thinking about it. Right. You got to think about thinking about it. And like, you know, I love that, that they've used that <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> You're going to have fun with this one. Uh, Willie Whipsaw for Lau. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be tough because I keep talking about being tactical here, but uh, I, th <laughs> I think have your convic convictions within your views, but don't be afraid to spot the opportunities and take advantage of them. Just don't, don't flip it day in, day out, month in, month out. Just have your, have your game plan, stick with it, hold your thesis. I like that. Uh, let's go on to the next. We got uh, from Mayberry, China's reopening. Um, it's, it's here. Welcome. So we'll, see, we'll see how it uh, affects the uh, global economy, whether it uh, continues to, you know, hopefully, uh, given that we, uh, we, we, we all said we, we like energy and industrial metals, hopefully it continues and uh, kind of pumps those sectors up. I would say, uh, you know, enjoy the revenge travel when they visit your neighborhood because <laughs> Chinese are coming everywhere, you know, right? So they're going to they're gonna do what the rest of us did on the revenge travel. Yeah. Uh, you know what? You already touched on this, Sherman, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. Uh, China's shrinking population. Um, I'm not convinced it's a long-term trend, you know. Um, I think that the COVID lockdowns had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, just again, looking at the birth rates plummeting. And so um, I'm not sure if it's a trend or if it's, you know, kind of a spot in, in this kind of uh, cyclicality of what, what happened with their economy. I will say it's been a long time coming, though. Uh, one, uh, one child birth policy for a while that they, they reversed relatively recently didn't seem to take hold as fast as they want, had hoped. So we'll see if, uh, if, if that will kind of... Uh, change this trend that or you know change the the direction that you're talking about there yeah and people are saying that uh this it's either sometime this week or the next that india will become the most populous country now so yeah uh, maybe we're gonna have to be focusing on that instead of china going forward all right next up uh we got the final stretch here we got wage growth slowing uh for mayberry let's go sticky inflation um, I think the, uh, I think it's the Atlanta fed puts out those sticky inflation and that's actually, um, been pretty sticky and, and it hasn't come down as much as, as the other portions of CPI. So, so that's still worrisome. Who would think that the sticky components were sticky? <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, leads into the Paul now looking at the services X rents, right. <laughs> In terms of the stickiness, trying, trying to extricate themselves from that. Perhaps it's actually it up. or X shelter. It's not services X shelter because the core goods is helping that number. Because if you actually take, and not to be uh, overly corrective of you, Sam, but if you take mm -hmm. services X shelter, it tends to be relatively constant. As uh, Mr. Rosenberg pointed out to me, yes, because it has healthcare and it has education, you know, as the key pieces of it. So just pointing that out. Uh, I also think it's because people still go out to eat, they still do things and they pay for that. So. Anyway, not to digress. Uh, swinging around, I think we're on you, Sherman, with terminal rate. Higher than the market forecast. Uh, let's go loud. Bank of Japan yield curve control. Uh, 
Yes, in a different form. Uh, let's go quantitative tightening. Autopilot. Just watching paint dry. Uh, I wanted to bring this word back. This would be fun. Transitory. Yeah, hey, you got me on that one. Um, asset prices. <laughs> I mean, it depends on how long your uh, your time frame is, right? So I was yeah. going to say, just I mean, define it. it. Just define yeah, exactly. it, and you'll be you'll maybe better off. Maybe yeah. it, it came into the whole into our world with <laughs> April 2021, and you know, yeah, no, and it, and it persisted for a long time. Yeah. It was not transitory. The use of transitory yeah. was not transitory. How's that? There it is. Uh, it's, you know, this is a little fun. Uh, FTX recovers five billion in liquid assets. I don't know if you guys saw that, that headline. That was for you, Al. Uh, oh, watch my language here, but uh, uh, shell game, shell game. Huh? Uh, What's that game Rick, called? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the real name. Ricard Monty. Ricard Monty. Uh, for Mayberry, we have South America. Mm, uh, I mean, my, I obviously went to uh, Argentina winning the World Cup is what it popped into my mind. So we'll go <laughs> with that. <laughs> All right, last three here. One for I was just two. watching last okay. night. I watched this uh, the Netflix show called The Redeem Team, too, and I forgot how the U.S. got smoked by Argentina, oh. and that's what kind of set them on the path of doing this too. And I also forgot LeBron got two gold, uh, two bronze medals. You know, when you look at those teams, it's like wow. Um, you know, so anyway, pretty pretty interesting documentary. But uh, Argentina uh, with people that you wouldn't know are are the ones that demolished the the U.S. in, in the second time that happened. All right. That so was last night, Kim, bro. That's what I watched. So. <laughs> I think I have to watch that now. It sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, need you to make a call here. Tom Brady's next season, Mr. Sherman. It's happening. Happening, man. It's unlike uh, unlike Aaron Rodgers. I think it's happening. That, that's a jab at Lau. Uh, he's uh, not coming to the Niners, Kimbro. He's definitely not going to your Jets. I know. I know. Um, I'd like to see him in Vegas, to be honest. I think what cooler than seeing him with the weapons they have there. And I think if you if he went to Vegas, they could re-sign Jacobs. That would be a pretty powerhouse team. Comes to the Niners, it's just not fair. But if if that's the case, we could sign him for cheap like New England used to do and sign him for below market. It would be a, a great, great thing. But you know I'm uh, I'm long Brock Purdy. So let's go Purdy. Let's go Purdy. Uh, let's go Lau. We have Twitter's kegerator auction. I don't know what this is, but it sounds nice. So just to give you a, little, a quick background, Musk is, is selling off a number of assets at Twitter. He's auctioning stuff from their offices. But one of the things they were auctioning was a kegerator uh, from their San Francisco office. Oh, well, so let me re restate forbid. what I said. It sounded nice while it was there. I'm not buying it, though. All right. It was been nice to have one. That. <laughs> not this uh, last up, Mr. Mayberry, we have Super Bowl winner projection. I gave that to you. Uh um, you know, I'm going to go with the chiefs. I think that, uh, no one's talking about them. They're flying. It's hard to be the number one seed and flying under the radar. Uh, but I think that, uh, it's going to be a chiefs Niners Super Bowl, And I think that, uh, the chiefs, uh, can go deep on the Niners and, and you know, go over their cornerbacks. And, uh, I think that's going to be the, uh, you know, may, maybe this will be my one. Uh, this will be the, uh, we didn't talk about Super Bowl last year. So, there was not, maybe there was not a, a a red X next to my Super Bowl prediction from last year. <laughs> yeah, the, if uh, Chavarius plays like he played last week, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> he he did not look like Chavarius Ward that he normally is out there too. So, uh, but yeah, uh, I still remember the uh, two score lead with like five minutes to play. Classic uh, Kyle Shanahan. So I hope you're right on on the teams, uh, uh, or at least one half of those teams, and. <laughs> Wrong on the outcome. So I mean, what would the over be on the in that game? It'd be like eighty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think anything with a five handler or below, you got to take the over. Yeah. Right? You know. So, um, all right. Well, thanks again, Mayberry, for joining us. I know we had a long Sherman says. Uh, I know you, you got to hop. I know you got another appointment to get to. So, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. We try to change the script a little bit on this one. Try to talk a little bit differently. Have a little longer Sherman says. So, shout out to Miley out there, Maylee. 
I don't know how I had to pronounce your name out there on Twitter. He's always asking for more Sherman says. So hopefully uh, you found that one entertaining. And for the rest of you, if uh, you have any uh, ideas for new guests, uh, people you'd like to hear from on the Sherman Show, hit us up at uh, the email address is shermanshow at doubleline.com. Or you can just blast us on the Twitter at Sherman Show Pods, the handle. So uh, you can also catch Mayberry and Lau on their other gig, um, the Monday Morning Minutes. To uh, was it D line minutes? Is that the Twitter handle? D line minutes, uh, all one word out there for the Twitter handle. Um, and you can catch them weekly where uh, they do it after the market close on Friday. It gets released every every week, even though it's called Monday morning minutes. Uh, people didn't want to wait. So uh, they now uh, they now deliver that after the bell on Friday. So thanks again, everyone. As, as I mentioned, too, we have our roundtables up. We had some distinguished guests, uh, pretty interesting views out there. Um, you know, I, I recommend uh, viewing it in the later half of the day with a cocktail. Um, some of it's a little depressing, uh, but in general, there's some great content there as well. So if you want to catch that, it's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash double line capital. So thanks again, everyone. We'll be back at you in a couple of weeks with a brand new guest. And uh, until then, uh, good luck with 2023 and enjoy the rally while it lasts. Take care.